The Value of IP Following a noticeable uptick in merger and acquisition activity last year, questions have arisen around the valuation of intellectual property under intangible assets. Article by Gary Anders Mergers and acquisitions activity surged to record levels in 2021, fueled by a wave of major deals. Among the biggest transactions of the year was Discovery's $43 billion US dollar merger with Warner Media, a business owned by the US telecommunications giant AT&T. In addition to the iconic Warner Brothers Film Studios business and its catalogue of thousands of movies and TV shows, the deal incorporates a powerful portfolio of famous entertainment, news and sports brands, including CNN, HBO and TNT. Discovery folded in its own stable of well-known TV brands, including the Discovery Channel, Animal Planet, and TLC. To get the deal over the line, both parties needed to agree on fair values of all of their respective assets. This included a huge list of intangible assets, such as registered trading names, digital copyrights, technology patents, designs and symbols, and other forms of intellectual property. Adding to the complexity of this enormous valuation exercise, was the fact that most of the intangible assets wrapped up in the merger are not listed on either company's balance sheets. That's because, under the relevant International Accounting Standard IAS 38 and Australia's equivalent standard AASB 138, entities are only encouraged, but not required, to disclose their intangible assets. There's a range of reasons for that. First and foremost, internally generated intangible assets such as brands are not recognised under the standards as having actual value. The standards deem that a book value can only be placed on acquired intangible assets resulting from a business takeover or merger. However, once recorded, the fair value of an acquired intangible asset cannot be increased over time. Furthermore, if an intangible asset has a finite life, it must be amortised. Facebook, for example, has more than $19.7 US billion in intangible assets, including what it calls acquired users, acquired technology, patents, and trademarks. This figure has been fairly constant for more than a decade, but only because Facebook has kept adding new acquisitions to its books. Kiyosu Ern, FCPA, Regional Manager Partner for the Financial Advisory Practice at Deloitte Southeast Asia, says the growth in the overall value of intangible assets has been particularly prominent across the technology sector as we progress towards knowledge-based economies with greater dependency on intangible assets. He says, a company that has gone through an acquisition will have it on their books, while a company that has grown organically will not have it on their books. The accounting standards don't really recognize internally generated intangible assets. For example, in Coca-Cola's books, the Coke brand is not recognized as an intangible asset. Likewise at Pepsi, Pepsi's brand is not recognized. But if Coke acquired Pepsi, then the value of Pepsi's brand would appear in Coca-Cola's consolidated books. The Coke brand would still not be there. Sue Earn says the financial statements in company annual reports, therefore, don't give real visibility over the value of intangible assets. He says, you cannot increase the fair value of intangible assets after an acquisition. It's quite difficult to understand, especially if you don't have visibility on what the business has gone through, whether it's organic growth or inorganic growth. One is on the books and one is not. We say, price is what you pay. The value is what you get after you pay the price. Ian McIntosh, FCPA, former vice chair of the International Accounting Standards Board, says that when a business takeover occurs, the acquirer needs to work out what intangible assets have been purchased and what has been paid for them. He says, but the real difficulty in all of it is getting a valuation. The standard setters in dealing with this are really worried about manipulation, that people are claiming figures that aren't at all realistic. McIntosh says another issue revolves around companies generating their own intangible assets through research and development, but these can't be capitalized on their accounts. He uses an example of pharmaceutical companies working on the development of medicines. He says, as you go, they're not really sure whether it's going to work or not, or be worth anything or nothing, and if it does work, how much it's going to be worth. There's lots of suggestions around that. Maybe you should be able to capitalize on that sort of expenditure, 
then write it off if it doesn't work. Then there's suggestions that you should be able to separate expenditure for work undertaken for current activities and for future growth, which can be hard to define and measure. Macintosh says, intangible assets should be itemized in a company's balance sheet in the notes to its accounts. But it's a lot of work, and there's a lot of debate around how useful the information is at the end of the day. When you take over a company, you might use their list of clients. What's that worth and how long is it going to last? They are really difficult questions to answer. Jack Shan, principal patent attorney at law firm Davis Collision Cave, says patents, trademarks, and other types of intellectual property are critical components of a business's intangible assets. He points out that intangible assets now account for about 90% of the value of the entities within the S&P 500 index of US listed companies. It's important for companies to keep a register of their intangible assets. The issue that I see with the traditional balance sheet approach to IP is that due to accounting standards, it's not easy to recognize R&D and put it on the books until it's sold and recognized as part of the goodwill. A significant share of the company's value resides in intangible assets, so it's important to identify and manage these assets well. But there is very little correlation between the cost of developing something and its ultimate value. You could develop something for very little, and then it could be highly valuable. Or you could spend millions of dollars on an idea that nobody wants. Shan says where it is important to involve registered patent attorneys and trademark attorneys as part of the due diligence process to gain a better understanding of the underlying asset's value. Shan says not valuing IP potentially risks missing out on the real value of assets. The opportunity is to have a clearer understanding behind the drivers of values, which can then be reflected in the business strategy. The University of Melbourne has recently conducted an investigation into disclosures of unrecognized intangible assets by Tier 1 Australian reporting entities for the Australian Accounting Standards Board. It found that entities are generally not making voluntary disclosures of unrecognized intangibles, although there are more disclosures from sectors in which intangibles typically play a significant role in entity values, such as the pharmaceutical and information technology sectors. Professor Michael Davin, FCPA, Chair of Accounting and Business Information Systems at the University of Melbourne, led the research team that published its findings in March 2021 in the report Disclosing Unrecognised Intangibles. He says, we did quite an extensive search within Australia and found that there's not much that's being voluntarily disclosed in the way of unrecognized intangibles, which is very interesting. It's okay when you're recognizing IP from an external acquisition point of view. It's when they are internally generated things that they become a lot more problematic. How do you distinguish between research and development, which is creating valuable IP? The distinction can be subtle. The change is whether you can expense it or capitalize it. There is an area of long-standing debate in accounting, which I don't think is ever going to be fully resolved. Davin says recognizing intellectual property can sometimes be a sensitive issue because companies don't want to disclose what they are undertaking to the market because of the competitive nature of their IP. Davin says, if you're doing research, do you want everyone to know what the research is and what the prospects are? Probably not until you're ready to properly announce that to the market. Davin says not recognizing intangible assets in a balance sheet may be fundamentally wrong, but the dilemma is to find a realistic value. The question comes from an investor perspective, which is, who are we trying to serve ultimately in reporting? Is this something that we leave to investors to work out from other sources? The annual financial statements are not just relevant, they're the trusted number. Yet, there are divergent views in the accounting world on how useful and accurate financial results statements and balance sheets are in helping individuals make informed investment decisions. Professor Baruch Lev, Professor of Accounting and Finance at New York University's esteemed Stern School of Business, says the treatment of intangible assets is at the heart of the issue. Lev was co-author of the controversial 2016 book, The End of Accounting and the Path Forward for Investors and Managers. Lev says, it's not the intangible assets themselves, but the clumsy treatment by accountants of intangibles, the mindless expensing of all internally generated intangibles, and the capitalization of singular acquired intangibles.
He notes that 70% of all high-tech and science-based companies in the US report losses, even though the economy is doing well, and most of these companies have large valuations in the market. Lev goes on to say, The reason they report losses is because of this expensing of intangibles. Half of this 70% of the companies that report losses, if they didn't expense intangibles, they would have reported profits. For me, I'm satisfied with just capitalizing those intangibles. You capitalize investment in a building, why shouldn't you capitalize investment in a patent? Lev says all identifiable intangible assets should be treated in the same way as ordinary assets. Capitalize the cost, put it on the balance sheet, and if, for example, in three, four years nothing comes out of it, then write it off. Davin has a contrarian view on the recognition of intangibles. Do we want to compromise the reliability of financial statements by introducing a valuation that may be more representative number of what the true value might be? But it could be wrong. Devon says there is an ongoing relevance versus reliability trade-off in the financial reporting of intangible asset values. Devon says, My view on that is that we want to be as relevant as we possibly can, but we shouldn't throw the baby out with bathwater. Because in the market of information... What we are providing in financial statements is the one reliable, trustworthy, credible source of information. If we sacrifice that in trying to increase the relevance of what we're doing, then we're in real trouble.